Points. What am I going to talk about? Well, the first thing I want, to, I want to show you is what is probably one of the single most important advancements in the research of alternative energies that has yet been presented here at the show. I'll give you the free energy device. <laughs> have, have any of you seen this on YouTube? Yep. Okay. <laughs> It, I've seen it on YouTube. It, it spins. It has to work. I, but mine doesn't work. So if somebody could help me, <laughs> help me figure this out. Something like. <laughs> oh, is that it? Okay. <laughs> All right. So. Who is this guy, Zero? Uh, I'm a guy who is, like many of you in this room, I'm an experimenter. I love to tinker in the garage. I've been doing it for decades. How did I get here? What else have I been working on? Where do I really want to start my, my research? And what has brought us all here today, collectively? I'm going to be introducing you to a like Regina Meredith and uh, Francesco Vassa fully understand. And I hope to be able to articulate it to you in such a way that I help you to wrap your heads around why we are all here today. All right? Uh, I am here today basically because I wanted to have a few drinks with you. Mark Nancy, but he had better things to do, like uh, improve the quality of life for millions in impoverished nations. So, you know, where where is his priorities? I, 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 so <laughs> let's start at the let's start at the beginning. Why zero fossil fuel? I don't know. I'm I'm so sorry about that. But, I, uh, I I came up with the name zero fossil fuel in an attempt to articulate. A, an idea that we need to move away from energy independence that is bought and paid, we have to pay for. Okay, we need to move away from a based economy to a renewable based economy. And quite frankly, zero fossil fuel was the, one of the few names on YouTube that wasn't taken. So I, I, I chose zero fossil fuel, and eventually I started a whole branding effort around it. And I became known as Zero and as Z, and I maintained my anonymity for a very long time. So why was I so anonymous? Because I was afraid of the boogeyman. Uh, there is a whole culture of fear that we need to break free from, OK? We all need to take a stand build a little courage and say, if there are enough of us with our experiments and present what it is we are working on, they can't stop all of us. We all have to work together. And that's why we're all here, OK? Some of us are here just to uh, listen to people talk. But many of you are experimenters. And if you are experimenters, I encourage you to publish your work, even if you don't think it is of value. Because there are, there are things that I have published many, many years ago that now, today, I will go back and look at and say, gee, you know, I didn't notice that in that video the first time. But I go back and look at it and say, wow, I missed that. Maury, I've got something for you that you're going to like. OK? Uh, other identities. Mr. Wizard, MacGyver, I've been called a lot of things, uh, some of which I can't say here today. But uh, <clears throat> it all started when I was a very young child. Uh, when I was about three years old, my memories go back that far, amazingly, 
I can remember vividly, this was the stereo cabinet that my parents had in their house. It was a Zenith record player. It had a slide out turntable with a mechanism underneath. And I would literally lay on the floor looking up at the mechanism underneath this turntable and just watch it for hours and watch it drop the records and watch the, the mechanisms go. And from, from the stair rails behind the radio that went up to the second floor, I would, I would take my head and I would plant it between, between the rails of the staircase and I would sit there for hours and just watch the tubes glow and say, what makes this thing work? So I had a fascination at a very, very early age that, that my mother fortunately recognized and nurtured continually. And I am forever grateful to my mother for doing that for me. When I was going to kindergarten, my mother was already buying me books that had math problems in them. I was doing third grade math in kindergarten. Now I vividly remember the arguments, okay? The, I remember vividly the arguments that my parents would have standing in the hallway of my elementary school with the teachers who said, you can't be giving this kind of, this kind of uh, information to your children. They need to be te learning the curriculum that we're teaching them. And my, mother would, and my mother would argue with them. But he is so far beyond this. Why, why hold him back? Well, he has, to be, he has to follow along with his class. And this is a classic example of the failing of our educational system to properly identify and classify students and put them where they belong in, in terms of the progress of their education. It's terrible what they do. But I'm so thankful that my mother ignored all of the teachers and the principals who said, no, we need him to follow our curriculum. He will continue to learn. I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. Are they trying? And I will say that I've I've cleaned this up and sanitized it quite a bit, <laughs> quite quite a bit for my audience. Okay, I'm sorry, but you know we we have we have viewers in in other countries, and all right. So let me just uh, skip back through here. Yada yada yada. Okay, so nobody says. Then everyone wonders why 17 other countries graduate more scientists than we do. But there's a reason. There's a reason. There's a reason for this. There's a reason education sucks, and it's the same reason that it will never, ever, ever be fixed. It's never going to get any better. Don't look for it. Be happy with what you got. Because the owners of this country don't want that. I'm talking about the real owners now. The big, the wealthy, that, the real owners, the big, wealthy business interests that control things and make all the important decisions. They don't want a population of citizens capable of critical thinking. They don't want well-informed, well-educated people capable of critical thinking. They're not interested in that. That doesn't help them. That's against their interests. You know what they want? They want obedient workers. Obedient workers. People who are just smart enough to run the machines and do the paperwork, and just dumb enough to passively accept all these increasingly jobs with the lower pay, the longer hours, the reduced benefits, the end of overtime, and the vanishing pension that disappears the minute you go to collect it. And thank you, George, for your words of wisdom. Please enjoy the show from your new front row seat. <laughs>
<laughs> so my mother, again, con continuing to foster my, my inquisitive nature in science, uh, would continually buy me more and more advanced science kits. And I went through kit after kit after kit like this from the 20 in one to the 50 in one to the 150 in one experimenters kits. Anytime she would buy me a remote controlled radio car, I would, the, the, the evening after I had it, the, the cover was off, it was, it was running around with an empty shell. <laughs> okay, I, I, would, I would build uh, uh, buzzer alarm circuits that were photo optically triggered and I would set them up in my bedroom, and, and she would come in at night to tuck me in, and she would cross the beam, and, it, and the thing would go off and just scare her half to death. <laughs> she put up with so much, but I'm so, I'm so grateful she did. Um, when I was about 10 years old, they bought me this Lafayette Comstat 25B CB radio. I got very heavily involved into CB radio and later into ham radio, and six months after I got that, my room looked like this. <laughs> no, 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 I'm just kidding. That's John Hutchison's uh, kitchen. <laughs> kitchen. <laughs> okay, so this, so this is really my lab today. Uh, I have the uh, Muller replication on, my, on the bench and the oscilloscope showing the waveform. Uh, the Matrix screensaver, my favorite movie of all time, a few pieces of test equipment. But this is the, uh, this is the workshop that I built the winter before last that has given me a place to work and uh, to experiment. So naturally, my mother fostered in me a love of learning. And one of the greatest things that we can do as parents is to pass that love of learning and a thirst for knowledge onto our children. I have two daughters, both of whom have graduated Western Connecticut State University cum laude, full scholarship. They were reading literally to their classmates in preschool, okay? I made sure that we had a traditional family. My wife stayed at home, I worked two jobs. She raised the children at home, I came home at night. Uh, we in, in, inculcated into our children a passion passion for learning and there's no greater gift that we that as a parent we can give to our children than a love of learning okay uh, both of them graduated cum laude my youngest daughter is uh, completing her master's in fine arts at Johnson State University in Vermont my uh, my oldest is going for her uh, bachelor's degree in nursing and uh, I'm immensely proud of my children thank you thank you uh, so, as I said earlier, uh, I, was, I was hired directly out of high school into, a, as a technician for a company that a next door neighbor worked for who recognized the talent that I had, and my parents never could afford to send me to college. So I, I got all of my job training on the job, and I became what is, what is traditionally known as a practical, non-degreed engineer. Uh, I have worked for... Uh, companies such as uh, Electromechanics, which was a division of combustion engineering. They manufactured nuclear power plants and system controls for the nuclear power plants. I was an engineering technician for them. I was an uh, engineering tech for a robotics firm. Did uh, some robotics work for several years. And after that, uh, I, I had a, uh, a failed business venture in uh, car phone sales. I lost my house over it. We uh, moved into a condo, we recovered, and I'm now living in uh, Connecticut, uh, in Burlington, Connecticut, and uh, we have a nice home again, so I'm very thankful for that. Uh, the last, latest uh, industry that I'm working in, that I'm still working in today, is I'm a field engineer for a company that installs and maintains the radio infrastructure for public safety two-way radio communications. We also do uh, radio communications for large corporations and, and, and fleets, truck fleets, things like that. Our latest project right now is Mohegan Sun Casino, which is a very interesting, very interesting project. So that's my brief, that's my brief history. I don't have a college degree. Anyone who asks me say, really? No, really, I don't. So on one of my earlier jobs, where I met my wife actually, uh, one of my coworkers introduced me to a magazine article 
from Science and Mechanics, spring 1980. And it was a magazine article that was published regarding Howard Johnson. And he said, Mark, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta get this magazine. He, says, he said, there's a tremendous article in there. It's right up your alley. He said, you're gonna love it. And I, and I read it and I ate it all up and I said, wow, this guy actually got a patent from the United States Patent and Trademark Office. I thought that was pretty impressive because it's tough to get a patent for something that anywhere resembles free energy from the USPTO. It doesn't happen. And uh, this goofy guy right here, he did it. So uh, I, I not only uh, bought, the, bought the magazine, I spent quite a bit of money building devices to try and replicate his, his invention. And uh, let's see here. Here's the, here's the magazine article. Now, I was very concerned at that time, even back then, that this type of technology, if it did work, would be suppressed. So at that time, in 1979, no, no, I'm sorry, 1997, I put up a website and I archived all of the information and left it as open source to the public because the patent had long since expired and the magazine publisher had long since gone out of business. And I, I wrote letters to the legal firm to make sure that I was covered, that I wouldn't get sued for, for copyright infringement. And I published all of this information online free of charge so that anyone could access it and reference it and hopefully succeed where I did not. Here's a copy of the actual, of the actual patent. Um, one of the things that people Will, will do when they replicate these, these motors or attempt to replicate them is they'll create one of these curved magnets. And that's fine. And I think you'll find that every attempt at a rep, motor, uh, Howard Johnson motor replication only has one horseshoe magnet. And the reason for that is because it's really hard to make these things. Nobody ever made a motor with two. And quite frankly, the reason given in the, in the magazine article for using two magnets was to decrease the amount of pulsing as the magnet traveled across the track. I don't think that's the reason at all. And I think that may have been the reason why all of us failed. I don't know. But I still hope, hold hope that maybe this thing could actually work if somebody built one with two magnets staggered across the stator food for thought. And that's part of what I do. When I publish my information on YouTube, I try to teach and I do my best to inspire others to build. This is an animation of how I felt the motor should be built and a representation of the magnetic fields as they impose on the rotor. After I tried and failed for many years to replicate this motor, I, uh, I went into a very long period of inactivity. I became very stale. And uh, during that time, other people tried to replicate it. Who can forget Milo? Anybody? <laughs> I hear a chuckle. <laughs> but notice, OK, even Milo, one curved magnet. Could he have made it work with two? I don't know. And then one day I saw this. Does anybody know what this is? That's correct. That's the first uh, storm device that was uh, shown on YouTube. And then I saw this. And I really thought I had an aha moment when I saw this video. And I said, wow, that looks like there's more energy being produced than what went in to actuate it. So suddenly, I'm building again. And I created this. And the reason that, that picture frame is so fuzzy is because at the time that I created that, I was just getting involved with YouTube. And I had just seen that YouTube video that you just saw. And I had nothing to film it with. Nothing at all, no, not even a webcam. So 
I took my Motorola Razor phone. How many of you remember that? Okay. <laughs> took my Motorola Razor phone, went online, found out how to hack it so that it would, rec would record video clips longer than 15 seconds at a time. And I recorded the whole thing with a Motorola Razor phone. By far, the worst video I have ever produced for, for YouTube. <laughs> Coincidentally, by far, the single most popular video I have ever produced for YouTube. Why? Because of my enthusiasm. Okay? I was pumped. I was excited. I was like, man, I got to build this. I got to show people. This is cool. There were 11 videos altogether in this series that I made when I attempted to replicate this device. Collectively, they have received, as of last Sunday, 1,927,201 views. The very first video in the series alone has received 872,816 views. I think that's pretty good. After I got involved with that, I started looking at HHO, close to Maury's heart. Okay? Um, and I tried all kinds of things. But the thing that I made sure to do along the way was I made sure that I published everything that I built, good or bad, whether it worked or failed, because it's important to present all of the story so that people recognize you as somebody who is not, not afraid to share his mistakes. Okay, That's really important. That builds credibility. And when you build credibility, people will trust you and they'll follow you. I have, incidentally, over 20,000 subscribers to my YouTube channel. I receive close to 8,000 unique visits daily to my YouTube channel. And I heard about this guy, John Ahrens, who had a Coke, Coke glass with a little tube and a piece of, piece of screen and a stainless steel wire wrapped around it, and wow, he was making gas. I thought that was pretty cool. So I said, yeah, I'll take, I'll take a look at that. I began, began uh, getting involved at overunity.com and, and looking at some of the stuff that was available there. And I met up with a few guys. We eventually formed the Energy Builders Network, started a forum, built the EBN, what is called a dry cell, which really is not a dry cell. It is merely not a submerged cell. Okay? People call a dry cell with the gaskets a dry cell. As long as there's liquid in contact with the plates, folks, it's not a dry cell. It's a wet cell. I'm sorry. But the fundamental structure of the, of the cell is more compact, so it, it, it had a great appeal to a lot of people who were experimenting. But this was the first S cell that I, that I constructed, and I made it like a fish tank so that when I was observing results, I could record the results on film and show people what was happening inside the cell. And this worked out very, very well. Here's a picture of the inside of the cell, and you'll notice not only do I have gas evolving off of the edges of the plates, but I also have gas evolving in the middle of the plates. Maury, you're going to appreciate this, okay? Pause the video right now, be right back. All right, I've added a Another small amount of, with uh, this cut straw, a small amount of sodium hydroxide to the solution. Stirred it in, allowed it to circulate, and the current at the, at the same voltage I had before immediately shot up to about 1.6 amps. So I backed the voltage down, and I am now running at probably about 100 volts and 1.1 amps. You can see at this current, at this current level, I still have uh, bubbles rising off of the edge of the plates, hydrogen on the negative side of the plates, oxygen on the positive. And we also see now the formation of bubbles in solution between the plates about three quarters of an inch from the top. That's at a current of one amp, and these plates are spaced at a quarter of an inch apart. Obviously, spacing is, is going to be uh, crucial in the finished cell. And 
now I'm going to crank up the voltage again to where we were before, previously. Got my own light. And I'll go to about an amp and a half. And immediately you can see the production of the gas bubbles in the intervening space between the plates dive down deeper between the plates. So we're liberating gas actually in solution as well as collecting the gas on the plates and liberating it that way. So, is that the third gas you were talking about? Maybe. Maybe. I did an experiment for Sterling one time. He asked me to see if I could collect that gas and, and cause it to settle in the bottom of a cylinder. Uh, at the time, I was doing it with what, uh, what I was working with for a, an HHO cell at the time that really was producing what I felt to be the best quality of gas, pure hydrogen, pure oxygen. Okay. Little did I realize that, that, that there may have actually been a third gas that might be this. So I will return to this at some point and try that experiment in, say, like a two liter soda bottle or something where you can just dump the gas in and allow it to settle and see if you can get it to go pop. And of course, I tried many, many designs. This is, a, this is a, I call the spiral cell or, or a resonance cell. It's, it's simply a, a replication of an electrolytic capacitor plate in solution that would uh, evolve the gas. That was pretty tricky to make. Here is a, an, a, an evolution of the S cell, which I called the VSPB cell, in, in an attempt to create a standardized language for uh, HHO experimenters to, to draw from, uh, I created a, a subset of descriptors to help people describe what it is they were working on so that they could speak in a common language. I don't know how many of you realize this, but most, most of the uh, measurements of the output of a, of a hydrogen oxygen generator like this is measured in, in a unit of measure called MMW. That stands for milliliters per minute per watt of energy input to the cell. I actually coined that term uh, because at the time there were so many disparate measurement, uh, measurements that were being used. People were using liters per hour per, per kilowatt of input or, you know, they were all over the map. And I said, we need a standardized unit of measure. So I came up with what seemed to be probably the easiest to compute and MMW is what evolved out of that. Uh, VSPB incidentally stands for vertical aspect ratio, series cell parallel plate design, brute force, rather than uh, I don't know what the other what the other definition for for it was. But the 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 intent for this was to create a column that would create a higher velocity of electrolyte flow between the plates to which may have created cavitation that you were talking about. Again, it's worth going back. I still have this cell in a Walmart jar sitting on a shelf that I might fire up again. Here is a inverted T cell that I attempted to make. There are circular plates in both, both halves of this T and there are, you attach a uh, electrode from one side of one end back around to the other end, that became the positive plate, and this terminal in the middle was the, was the negative terminal, and the gas would evolve through the cylinder and then out, out the exhaust at the top. That was inspired by a gentleman named Daryl Mason, who uh, is out in the Seattle, Washington area. In everything that I did, I was always very, very careful to take careful measurements, okay? Because if you don't measure what you're doing, you have no way of knowing whether or not you're making any progress. All right? And in that respect, this is, this is probably how uh, me and Mark Dancy became friends. Because Mr. Mark, show me the data. Dancy recognized that I was doing this and publishing my work and making sure that I was collecting data that was meaningful. All right? Very important. Measure what you're doing. Here I am. Uh, testing a, uh, a runtime test with a AC generator. So I had 30 milliliters of gasoline that I was putting in a cylinder, measured amount. It would filter down into the carburetor. The AC output went into my DC supply, 
the DC supply went over to my pulse width modulator circuit. We'll talk about that in a minute. Here's my VSPB cell with a bubbler filter on the, on the side and then feeding the gases back into the carburetor. What I was doing was checking to see if I could increase the overall net efficiency of the whole system, raising it from something less than 20% to even something greater than 20%. Okay, You don't have to make it run to make it viable. As long as you can achieve uh, a, a net efficiency gain and everyone said, no, 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 you can't do that. Well, I tried and with this one, I, I didn't achieve a net gain, but I did show that there was a net effect as I continued to increase the amount of the injection of the, of the HHO gas into the engine. So I took it to the next step. Here is uh, what I call the bat cell. And the reason it's called the bat cell is because it resembles a 12 volt battery. Anyone who knows how a, a 12 volt automotive car battery is made, it is divided into six chambers. And each of the chambers is electrically isolated and the gases are all collected across the top through one, through one nipple and then out the bubbler. Here, is, here again is my pulse width modulator and uh, the uh, multimeter that I was using to uh, measure the volt input voltage. Here is where I made real progress. This is what I called my runtime test jig. Uh, this was with a Briggs & Stratton motor. It was powering a automotive alternator that was the only DC source for the pulse width modulator, which is down here in the shadows. You can't see it. And it was running my uh, bat cell at about 6 mmW efficiency and going through this bubbler and back into the engine. And with this, I actually did achieve a net overall gain in total system efficiency. As crude as this setup is, with a lawnmower, a horizontal shaft lawnmower engine, I was able to accurately measure, uh, and incidentally, this right here, this was my fuel reservoir. I would put measured amounts of fuel and run tests with these measured amounts of fuel each time. And I did like, uh, the first time I did it, I, I, I repeated the test about 10 times and found that I had a margin of error of plus or minus 3%. I was like, hmm, that's pretty good. I probably don't need to repeat the test 10 times every time I do it because you'll also notice it's dark out. I was working late into the night and I was probably <laughs> bothering my neighbors while I, was, while I was doing that. But I collected the data and I published the data and that data is still available at my website, alt-nrg.org. Um, it's viable data and it is, not, it is not refutable, at least not in my mind. Somebody can always uh, approach you and say, well, gee, we don't think you collected your data correctly. Well, that's a matter of interpretation. For myself, I was able to satisfy myself that yes, HHO is a viable technology. It can be used to increase the overall net efficiency. It is a losing game if you're trying to do it in a modern automobile because the electronics of the modern automobile will fight you every step of the way. And it will not allow you to uh, to go much further. So through all of this, what did I learn? I learned that I could teach. I learned that I had a very good talent to be able to teach other people, to publish and to share openly. Now if I could only regenerate that head of hair, <laughs> I'd be so happy. I would be so happy. Okay? But what do we get? when we teach other people and inspire them. We get guys like this, okay? Who build amazing things like this and like that <laughs> and this Sterling engine, a Bedini wheel, a Roden coil, Starship coil, an infinity motor, which of course didn't work, but all these tools are learning tools. A wire straightener out of scrap. A toroid coil winder, which he also has on display here. If you haven't seen it, boy, you got to see this thing. This, the, it's just the coolest thing. Here is his EPG. Here is the pulse fire circuit, which is controlled by an Arduino 
which incidentally is the same processor that I'm using for my Mueller motor demonstration that's also on display. Here is his voltage intensifier circuit that he made. His hydrogen gas gun to condition the hydrogen gas as it passes through the center. There it is with the LEDs illuminated. His 3D printer, which he also brought here. Coolest damn thing I've ever seen. And of course, his own pulse motor build-off entries, which is his contest that he uh, enters himself to make everybody feel bad. <laughs> but, the, but this is just brilliant stuff. I mean, the, the, the workmanship that goes, he is a, an amazing, amazing builder. Russ, are you in the room today? I saw, I saw him. Oh, he's outside? Okay. I don't even know what this is. I don't even want to, I, I don't, I, I don't want to guess. <laughs> and, uh, uh, he, he calls he calls this uh, the burnometer. Does anybody, yeah. Does anybody know what he does with that? I don't. I don't know. Yeah, okay. Well, this is the PAP engine, and he brought that with him here today too. Really amazing stuff. He he has amazing skill with a milling machine. He know he knows his he knows his way around it. Uh, Now, my own, my own experiments uh, with HHO led me to try to re relieve a problem that people were having with their HHO experiments. Namely, when you, when you apply power to an HHO cell, it will generate some heat. And as it generates heat, it, it, its conductivity goes down, and the amount of current that, that it draws from your power source goes up. And that can generate a runaway condition. So I began. Uh, working on what I call the constant current pulse width modulator. This is one of my early prototypes that I was using to experiment, and it eventually evolved. Oops. It eventually evolved into a finished product that looked like this. I sold roughly 120 of these, uh, and, and to my knowledge, the vast majority of them are still out there working, helping experimenters. Uh, work on their projects. I also have this on display at the table out back if you'd like to see it. And of course, I never forgot to have fun along the way. Here, here I am, I, I, this is, and, and these videos are, va are so much more popular than I ever thought they would be, but they were a break from the normal routine. I showed people how I, I put the, the uh, golf ball on top of the tee inside of one of those globes. I drive my girls crazy because they'll walk over to my computer desk just to, just to bug dad and go like, like that, shake it off, and I'll walk over and I'll just go. And I go, <sighs> we hate you. Here's a Jacob's Ladder that I, that I made for fun while I was doing the Kapanadze experiments. Here's a, uh, a, a breakdown video for a rebuild of an old air rifle that I had when I was a kid. And uh, people love this one. I mean, especially with all the uh, legislation that's coming out in, in, in opposition to firearms and, and things like that. But this, this was a fun video to make. It's about 35 minutes long and uh, gets an amazing amount of, amount of traffic. There's a uh, recumbent bicycle that I made that was inspired by uh, a, uh, a gentleman from uh, Belgium. Uh, I, forget what, I forget what his YouTube channel name is. But this, this is still a work in progress because this space right here, I now have three 12-volt uh, batteries. And right about here, I've got a motor controller and a little electric motor on the back swing arm. And I'm making this a hybrid recumbent bicycle. It's a blast to drive. I'll tell you, people, people look at you going down the road, and uh, How fast is it? I'm sorry? How fast will it go? How fast will it go? Uh, I haven't taken it down the hill behind my house yet, uh, <laughs> but it, I can tell you it is very aerodynamic and it is very easy to pedal uh, beyond 35 miles per hour. I've had it, I think, up to about 38 miles per hour on human power. I think it will do about 45 miles per hour. And that's enough even to keep up with traffic on, on a normal street. So, you know, a lot, a lot of fun. And then, of course,
All right, so here we go. Bottles out in the yard. Fire in the hole. <laughs> All right, then. And here's what we got. There's a bottle, what's left of it. And of course, they have to rebuild the cap. They want to have a safe fourth in July. Please come on. <laughs> And I didn't bother to film the 1.75 liter plastic plastic handles that I was setting off in the yard as well. Uh, the neighbors heard that though. But uh, <laughs> but you got to remember you got to remember to have fun. Uh, it's it's you know it's it's not worth it if you can't have a little bit of fun. So where am I going? Uh, what I really want to be doing is stuff like this. Okay, I want to be teaching, presenting, like I'm doing right now. I want to be doing more interviews like this. This is Larry Jarbo. That, uh, that frame was taken from a video that I, that I shot at Jarbo's Mill, uh, 2009, I think, maybe. I've, I've done like three interviews with Larry. He's a great guy. He built a, an electric race car that he would compete with, and uh, he showed that to us on his farm. We had uh, a, a real, real good time at his event. Uh, here is a gentleman named Archie Folweiler from the Mid-Atlantic Renewable Energy Association. He's an old oil man who, who left the industry and started getting into uh, permaculture and renewable energies. And he, he created a whole business model around community solar and made it a viable business model in today's economy. Uh, real, real fun interview I had with him. This is Franz von... I beg your pardon? Solar. Yeah. This is an interview I did with Franz von Holzhausen at the Tesla Model S debut party in New York City, which I was invited to. That was a lot of fun. Uh, I found out that uh, Franz was a fellow Connecticut native from Sim Simsbury, Connecticut. And uh, we had a real great interview. Uh, that's not the one. And then, of course, my latest interview was with Eric Dollard at the uh, Bedini Lindemann conference in Hayden, Idaho. Uh, that was a little bit of a disappointing interview. I would have liked to have had some, a little bit more enthusiasm from Eric. He's still very bitter over the uh, hurdles that he's had overcome. Brilliant man. Brilliant man. And he has inspired quite, uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, creativity, I want to say, in my own self that I hope to be able to tap. This is the Mueller motor in its most complete state before I started tearing it down and, uh, to, to what you see on the table behind the hotel today. Uh, it is assembled with nine sets of coils all the way around, two of which are driven that spin the rotor, and then the remaining seven coils were acting as pickup units in a generator fashion. You see the, the uh, pickup wires going around with full wave bridge rectifiers all connected together. Uh, I managed to get about 60% efficiency out of this motor altogether. Never achieved the overunity that Bill Moeller claimed for it, but it was a learning tool, and it is still a learning tool. I use it, I use it now to test various uh, coil configurations. I have on display conical-shaped coils, hemispherical-shaped coils, pancake-shaped coils, and by far the pancake coils seem to be working the best. Here's a close-up of the driver circuit that, that I assembled for that. All of it is uh, just on perf board. And then I did something completely out of the box. I decided to go, uh, some, someone, one of my, <laughs> one of my YouTube nerd herd, and I, and I affectionately call him my, my nerd herd because oftentimes on Ustream, I will broadcast live from my workshop. I've got probably four or five webcams set up all over the, all over the uh, workshop, different angles uh, for what, uh, what that would focus on what I'm working. I have a uh, over the bench view, I have an over the shoulder view. Uh, and typically on an evening when I'm broadcasting live, working on a project in the lab, I'll have 15, 20, 25 people in my chat room, all just sharing, just chatting amongst one another, sharing, exchanging ideas. And one of, one of, my, uh, one of my nerd herds suggested, you know, see, you should, build a, uh, you should build a rocket scope. And I said, why? Well, it's really efficient. You should look into it. So I looked into it, and I thought, wow, 
that, that's pretty cool. That, that would be nice to heat my shop. And I came up with a design that, in, that incorporated uh, basically two different types of designs that was either all fire brick or all steel. And I made a hybrid. I said, all right, let's, let's build a, uh, a rocket stove that, that merged both of these designs into one. And this has performed fabulously. The fire brick has held up for two seasons, absolutely no degradation whatsoever. I heat my lab all winter long, and it, I, I tear down roughly six broken down shipping pallets of wood is all I need to heat my, to heat my shop for an entire season. Think about that. It consumes one-tenth the amount of wood as a traditional wood stove. It doesn't even require a vertical flue for the exhaust gases to leave the building. Okay, the, ver the, the flue can literally be horizontal and snake back and forth through what's called the thermal mass to retain the excess heat that's being exhausted so that it can be radiated after the stove has been shut down. There's the completed stove with additional fins around the tank, and this is where all of the heat is extracted inside the rocket stove. There's a small burn chamber. The wood just sits vertically in the burn chamber and it feeds itself down as it continues to burn. It burns extremely hot and the reason it's called a rocket stove is because it literally sounds like a rocket when it's running. It goes <laughs> it's, it's wild. It's, it's fun to burn and uh, my wife actually wants me to build one now for the house. And uh, <laughs> I said, you know, honey, I, I don't know if I want to do that. She said, why? I said, because I'm going to have to feed it. <laughs> huh? <laughs> but the kitchen is done. That's right. Yeah, I, I, I did the kitchen. Okay, so, so where am I going? Uh, with the inspiration from Eric Dollar and some of the papers that he's written on AC, uh, AC induction, he has the, uh, the four-quadrant theory paper that he wrote, very interesting paper. He has a couple of interesting stories that he told about his early childhood in high school where he had a three-phase transformer. And with this transformer, he miswired it because he wanted it to be a single-phase transformer and uh, connected it in such a way that when he applied AC power to it and it didn't work, he took AC power away from it and then it burned up. So obviously, whatever it was, he mistakenly did, continued to run after he removed his source. Now, he believes that it operated on the principle of what's called a magnetic amplifier. And a magnetic amplifier is a, nothing more than a transformer that has a DC biasing coil on it that when you apply a, a, a straight DC bias to the coil, you end up saturating the core so that when you apply an AC signal to any of the other coils, that core will saturate and operate in a non-linear mode. And when it does that, it, actu it can actually be used as an amplifier of current. Okay, very significant, very significant. This was the very first audio amplifier. It wasn't a transistorized device. It wasn't a vacuum tube device. It was a magnetic amplifier. Very simple. If you, do, if you do any research on YouTube or Google magnetic amplifier, you'll find a lot of interesting information on it. Um, so he had this three-phase transformer. And then also at the bedini Lindemann conference, I heard a gentleman named Jim Murray give a speech. And Jim recounts an incident where he was working at a gravel plant as the, as the electrical engineer. And they received their power from a substation across the river. The utility company was raping the gravel company for power because it was based on peak demand. And when the gravel company would start up their enormous conveyors loaded with ore, the inrush currents that would be created when they started those motors up was, was creating such a load that the power companies were killing them for the service. And they, and they said to, to Jim, Jim, can you do something for us? And Jim said, yeah, I, I can do something. He said, you see that uh, crane that you're decommissioning over there? He said, give me the motor out of that and I'll build you a, a uh, I, think you call it, I think it's called an AC condenser. I forget what the actual name is. Does anybody? 
know what the name for the, I'm sorry? That's it, synchronous condenser. Who came up with that? You did, thank you. <laughs> no, I did not, I did not build it. Jim built it and it took him about three years to install it at this gravel plant. And Jim got the idea one day, He's, he, he became friends with the owner of the substation across the river. And they would frequently lose power. And at, at dinner one evening, Jim said to his friend, he said, you know, next time we lose power, I want to try an experiment. He said, I want you to fire, when, when you fire up the generators, I'm going to run over to the gravel plant and I'm going to fire up the synchronous condenser. And I want to tweak it, and I want to see what happens. I want to see if, if I can make something anomalous happen. So, as, as fate would have it, nature complied. Uh, they lost power from the grid. The friend from across the river said, Jim, I'm going to be firing up the generators. Jim said, I'm going to the shed. And he fired up the generators, got on the phone. Jim said, all right, are you ready? Let's do the experiment. So Jim turned, on, turned up the synchronous generator, and he began to artificially change the frequency of the synchronous condenser from 60 hertz all the way up to 120 hertz. And the moment that he hit 120 hertz, exactly double the input frequency, the load that appeared from the generators across the river vanished. Said to Jim, Jim, what did you do? Did you shut down? Jim said, no, everything's running fine over here. Really? He says, I don't see any load over here. Jim was like, OK, we got something. <laughs> All right. Jim opens the door. It's pouring rain outside. Looks at the lines going, the high tension wires going across the river, cherry red. And, it, and just at that moment, boom! Exploded. Now, being the good engineer that he was, he called up the owner of the gravel plant and said, geez, you know, guys, we lost power. Uh, you, better get the, you better get somebody out here real quick. You know, I, I don't know what happened. <laughs> Okay? But there's a common thread. There's a common thread in both of these stories that I think is worth investigating. So here's the core of a typical three-phase transformer. Here are the coils on a typical three-phase transformer. These coils are divided into two halves, input and output. I haven't shown it here, but each one of these has two coils in it, All right, a primary and a secondary. And the primaries and secondaries are connected in either delta delta, delta y, or yy configurations. Delta y, incidentally, is by far the most, most common. I don't know what Eric did, but I'm going to find out. So in a typical, typical three-phase transformer, if this coil is energized, it is inducing current into these two coils. If number two is energized, it is inducing voltages into the two outer coils. And of course, if number three is energized, it induces voltages into the previous two. And it th didn't render correctly in this PowerPoint presentation, but they actually traveled, of course, through the core this way. All right. At the University of Ottawa, this gentleman built what he called the bitoroid transformer. We have 10 minutes. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna race through this a little bit, and then I'm gonna take a couple of questions from the audience. So essentially, what became of the bitoroid transformer is we added another path for the magnetic flow. So instead of traveling to here and to here, you also had a third path coming around here. The problem with this design is still thinking two-dimensionally, okay? If you were to take this whole assembly and turn it on its end, you still have a two-dimensional device, all right? Why not make it a three-dimensional core? And then you have equal distribution of your flux patterns to all the coils. This is what, this is what I will probably be the next project in my lab. And you can expand on this and continue to build out. Now, one of the things that Eric Dollar speaks of when he talks about electromagnetic induction, all right, he also makes reference to the dielectric field, which is at right angles to the electromagnetic field. 
Now think of, e think of each of these coils as a fountain. And you're looking at the top of the fountain and the electromagnetic fields are flowing up through the core, out, and back around through to each core. Therefore, if you have electrostatic lines of force, they are at right angles to the electromagnetic lines of force. All right, and you have these electrostatic fields around each of the coils. Okay? And in reality, those electrostatic fields extend out to the edges of the electromagnetic fields which are passing through the adjacent coils. And they overlap. Okay? Anybody see a familiar pattern developing here? About right here. Might there be some inspiration there? I don't know. I'm going to find out. I'm going to play. But as I was making this presentation, I noticed that just as I was making the presentation, I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. Hmm. Maybe that's worth looking at. Okay. What really brought us here today is a desire. Oh, yeah, this, this gets into the collective consciousness. Um, I'll touch on that real quickly. Um, what brought us here today is the collective. All right. We are part of something bigger than what we realize. It's very hard for us to visualize what we are part of because we are such a small part of it. Business is very much like that. Labor unions, religion, government, gangs and cults. Many would say those are two the same. But. And then there is the granddaddy of all, of all uh, collective consciousness. But the reality is a business as, a, as an entity is a collection of people who form the business, who are able to achieve things far greater than any individual could. A business is not the sum of its parts, but it is the exponential product of its parts. So what one person could achieve, two people can achieve four times as much, three people can achieve nine times as much, and so on and so on. And now we have five minutes, so I've really got to hurry. The business has an idea, a plan, and an action. Hopefully it grows and makes lots of money and becomes something really big. But the business personality is made up by the management and by the, uh, uh, the staff or the people who are hired as part of the business. Labor unions were formed to eliminate conditions such as this. And they are largely responsible for many of the benefits but when the labor union becomes more concerned about self-preservation than about helping its workers, now it, is, it becomes a detriment to business. And many of these collective consciousnesses, if you, if you think of them that way, their primary, their primary purpose is self-preservation. They want to survive. Okay. Religions, same thing. The religions themselves become an entity whose only purpose is self-preservation at the expense sometimes of the parts that make it up. And the granddaddy of them all, not even government, but the granddaddy of them all, is the economy. The last time you went to the polls to vote for a president, what was the first thing on your mind? And the moment you begin to think in terms of, I'm voting based on the economy, you become part of that whole global consciousness that is the economy. Because you're making decisions in your daily lives that affect the economy, that affect how, how the economy affects you. Oops, wrong way. The economy has arteries. It is so evolved, it has veins, it even has capillaries, it has red blood cells that carry the hemoglobins, which are you and I, that bring the oxygen to the economic engine that make it run. 
and it even has a pulse. Thump, thump. Thump, thump. Thump, thump. Thump, thump. Thump, thump. It really is alive. So do we destroy the beast? I think that would be shooting ourselves in the foot. But we certainly need to tame the beast. How do, exactly. Okay? We need to tame the beast. How do we do that? We're here. We're part of the solution. We're becoming white blood cells. We're going to fight the infection that is making the body sick. And we are part of the solution. We are the change agents for the entire world. And we are the global breakthrough energy movement. Okay. So what so what do we do? Join me together we can move the galaxy. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, incidentally, one, one parting thought. I want everybody to know that all of this presentation was created with open source software on the Ubuntu Linux operating system Ubuntu. using LibreOffice. Yay! Video edited with Caden Live and the pictures edited with GIMP 2.8. Where do you want to go today? <laughs> and get gypsies. <laughs> Time for a quick question? Yeah. Uh, we can do uh, questions and answers at the panel. Okay, tonight. please save, save the questions for the panel tonight. Thank you all. Uh, coming up is Russ Grease. I hope you stick around. He is awesome. Yeah, we're just going to take a couple more minutes for our next speaker. I'm sure everybody is going to enjoy very much. Well done. Very good. Thank you. Really well done, sir. Very good, I forgot to put your joke in there. Damn it. <laughs> Excuse me, can I just ask you something? I was, I was a couple of minutes late uh -huh. for the start of this, and you were talking about a device which looked like a little Momoto or some sort. Where did that originate from? This device? No, it wasn't that. It was